All right, good morning. Welcome to Santa Barbara Community Church. Will you please stand and join us in worship? Our God, a firm foundation. Our God, a firm foundation. Our rock, the only solid ground. Nations rise and fall. Kingdoms once strong, now shaken. We trust forever in your name. The name of Jesus. Trust the name of Jesus. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. You are the only King forever. Almighty God, we lift you higher. You are the only King forever, forevermore. You are victorious. Welcome to Santa Barbara Community Church. We are here for this, this the sole purpose of praising God, and we're really glad that you could, could join us in worship. Um, this is Tyler. Say hi, Tyler. Tyler helped me yesterday with changing a bunch of drum heads um, on our drum kit. <laughs> I have a visual aid. This is the old one. Um, as you might imagine, something that has been hit by a stick thousands and thousands of times was not in great shape. Um, the old bed, drum heads were basically dead and they just didn't have any life in them left. And so we changed them, and we were amazed. We're like, wow, it sounds 
fantastically better. It was really cool. Um, and many of us can kind of feel like uh, an old drum head, like we've been hit by a stick over and over sometimes. But I have some encouragement from Isaiah. This is Isaiah 40:31. It says, "They who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up on wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint." I want to focus on that that word renew. Friends, if we want to renew our strength, there's nothing to buy. You just need to wait on God. And so, to wait means to pause, to delay, to stand by, or to take an intermission. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to bow in silence just to wait on God and to listen to him. God, we're, we're here to, to listen to you today. Will you give us ears to hear? Yes, you lead me by still waters and take me to the pastures green. presence of my foes and you anoint my head in my cup it overflows and surely I will dwell in the house of the Lord Surely, and surely, 
God, you are so good. Will you please speak to us today, God? We're thankful for all that you are going to do. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may grab a seat. Hello? Oh, there we go. Good morning, church. How are we doing? Good. Um, my name is Mandy Dupar. If I haven't met you before, I am the youth pastor of fifth through eighth graders here at our church. And I'm Caleb, and I work with our high school students. Uh, this morning, we get to tell you a little bit about uh, youth ministry and youth leadership specifically. Before we do that, uh, I wanted to remind you that in two weeks, uh, August 22nd, uh, we're having a, a bit of a special Sunday. Uh, it's going to be a fall kickoff of sorts. And so we're going to have one service that day out here. It's going to be at 10 a.m. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us. And we hope that you'll join us and stay because we're going to be having lunch. We'll be providing lunch. So you got to just come. We're just going to have some family time as a church. Uh, so we hope to see you in two weeks. We hope to see you in one week as well. But, <laughs> but in two weeks, we're having a special Sunday. Hope to see you at both. Um, well, we are here to tell you a little bit about our youth ministry this morning. Um, we are going to get straight to it and just say that we want to invite you today into what we think is one of the most important um, responsibilities we have as a, as a church family, and that is pouring into the lives of our 5th through 12th graders. Um, you may not know much about our youth ministry, but if we could boil it down, the fact is our youth ministry, the backbone of it is our youth leaders. Caleb, Katie, Andy, and I, we could not do what we do as a youth ministry team without our youth leaders. And I said it at the last service, but that has been accentuated this past year in COVID more than any other year. Um, and so if you are currently a youth leader or have served as a youth leader, I know you may hate this, but would you please stand up so that we can acknowledge you and thank you for the ways that you've served our children? Yeah. Yeah, so most of the work uh, of our youth leaders happens in small groups. So in seventh grade, our students are split into small groups of about four to eight students uh, with the hope that those groups will stay together from seventh through 12th grade uh, with the same youth leader. And small groups really are kind of the central piece of our youth ministry. They're a place where students get to connect and be discipled and mentored uh, with a leader who they can have a long-term relationship with. It's a place where they can have peer-to-peer -peer, uh, fellowship and community uh, and a place where they get to practice living uh, life with Jesus in community. Uh, I've been on youth ministry staff here for about nine years, uh, and I'm convinced more than ever uh, that, that if we really care, if we really care about our young people loving and meeting and knowing Jesus, 
then we have to commit uh, as adults to, to spending time with them, for, to being in their life. Uh, and one of the main ways we, we do that here is through youth leadership and through our small groups. Um, so, Yeah, so that's where you all come in, church family. <laughs> um, we are blessed as a church, and we have so many young people and teenagers in our youth group. Um, and we love them, and we love spending time with them. But with um, the amount of kids we have, we have... A, a proportional need for adult leaders in their lives. Um, like I said, we as a staff of four can only go so far with how many students we have, and this is where we need you. We need other people who are following after Christ to walk alongside these fifth through 12th graders and show them what it looks like to follow you as you follow Christ. Um, so, Maybe you have considered youth leadership before, maybe you have never considered it, but we want to invite you into it this morning. And youth leadership isn't for everybody, but it is for more people than you may think. And so Caleb and I often get questions about this, and so we just want to address some misconceptions that there might be about youth leadership this morning, just to quell your questions. So Caleb, do I have to be uber extroverted and like a stand-up comedian to be a youth leader? Definitely not. Uh, our hope is not for our youth leaders to be entertainers, but instead people who model Christ-likeness, uh, who walk alongside our students uh, in their lives. So we're actually looking more for consistency, for faithfulness. Uh, and so our students aren't all the same, so we don't need all of our leaders to be the same either in terms of personality. Amen. Uh, Caleb, what if I don't like teenagers? <laughs> then you should confess your sins and repent. Amen. All right. Caleb, I feel like I am too old to be a youth leader. Mm. So actually, <laughs> mm. Mandy and I uh, <laughs> together have quite a bit of, of youth ministry experience. And in our experience, uh, Many, most of our youth leaders who are what we may consider past typical youth leader age have been really our best youth leaders. They really have been our best youth leaders. And in part, this makes a lot of sense. They've been following Jesus longer. They have more life experience to draw on. They've maybe raised teenagers themselves. They've lived with Jesus through good and through hard times. Uh, and, and so often, uh, you may think that age may be uh, something that holds you back from youth leadership, whereas we see it as an asset to our ministry uh, and would love to have more youth leaders who were past typical youth leader age. Yeah, that's actually a pointed goal of ours is to incorporate more youth leaders of different ages. That That is um, one of our goals as a youth ministry team. So I hope all your misconceptions about youth ministry, all of them have been resolved today. Now, um, if you have more questions, we are more than happy to answer them. We're more than happy to talk to you about what it could look like to get plugged into youth ministry. And... So, <laughs> we have a table in front of the community room after the 11 o'clock service where we would love to talk to you about it, and we have donuts because bribery is a part of our job. So, please come, grab a donut, talk to us. We would love to talk to you, um, and thanks for hearing a little bit about our ministry this morning. going to pass it off to Ken. All right. Good morning, everybody. It's great to have you all here today. We're going to go from talking about worshiping here in Santa Barbara to how we can get involved and serve our Lord kind of on the other side of the world. I'm actually going to invite two of our brothers here. If Kevin Callaway and uh, Tim Kuros can come on up. Give me a hand. <laughs> we're very thankful for them. And uh, we're going to share a little bit. Sorry, I should do this. And we're, they're going to share a little bit about some of the exciting things that God's been doing in their hearts and their lives and uh, some exciting things. Uh, some of you may be familiar with uh, Say and Yabior. 
uh, they are starting a Christian school that we have supported in the past. And uh, these brothers are actually going to be going out very soon. And we're going to be sending them out. And so some of us know you. Many of us know you. You guys have been here a lot longer than me. But uh, why don't you just start off. Can you just introduce yourselves first? Yeah, I'm, I'm Kevin Calloway. And I started uh, initially going to this church uh, back when I was at Westmont. So that was a little while ago. So I've been here a while. Um, yeah, so we're, we're going to be leaving in three weeks. We're going to go to Liberia, Gompa, Liberia, and we can talk about that in a minute. Tim Kuros, I started uh, last Sunday of 1979. <laughs> <laughs> Mic drop right there. Uh, some of us are familiar with he's like, he's like, I was at the bar. Uh, some of us know Say and Yabior. Again, the exciting work that they're doing in Western Africa. Uh, can you just tell us about what's going on in Liberia, this Christian school that we've been involved with as well, too, and this exciting work that you guys are going to be going out and, and participating in? Yeah, um, the whole process started uh, with the Pattersons. And so uh, Ben and Loretta um, have known the Bjors uh, for 25, 30 years. They first came over here during um, the uh, Civil War that was in Liberia. So they basically fled Liberia. And they have been mentoring them uh, for, for many, many years, and that's how they've been introduced to our church. Um, Loretta really has kind of been our guide through all of this, where she's uh, really provided uh, real, a lot of prayer and a lot of support and a lot of uh, good ideas to help us think about how we would approach this. Anyway, they have a, a school that's been built. Uh, it's already built. Um, they have uh, room for 1,200 students. I think they're going to start with 500. Um, they have 12 rooms that are fully furnished, ready to go. Uh, we, as a church, participated last year in sending a 40-foot container full of uh, thousands of books and furniture and a lot of other things that have helped them get started there. So you've, always, you've been involved in this, whether you know it or not. Um, and so we're, uh, we're going to go uh, and, and try to initiate and try to get the school started. They do have 25 teachers that they've hired. They have... Uh, three administrators that they've hired. So we've been in conversation with uh, Say online uh, for quite a while, uh, trying to figure out uh, the best way to help them get started uh, with their school. The name of the school is Riverview uh, Christian Academy. So Riverview is serving their uh, community uh, on the border of uh, Guinea and, and uh, Liberia. And then Christian, we're going to have, uh, obviously, that's, that's a big part of uh, the reaching the community. And then Academy Rigor uh, for Academics. Amazing. Amazing. So as we're just sending you out very soon on this trip, how can we as a church family be supporting you in prayer? Uh, one of the things that uh, we've learned is that uh, things are a little different than Africa than the way we might organize things. Um, so they still uh, really need to furnish a number of the other rooms that they're going to be filling. Uh, they are going to need uh, textbooks. They don't have textbooks yet, so that's something that we're going to uh, have to try to, as a church and other, other groups. Uh, actually, they're involved with the group. The group that supports them and, and uh, is primarily their, their uh, leadership group is called Christian Leadership Training International. So um, they're, they're in Indiana. So we support uh, that larger organization. So we can pray for those things, and we can pray uh, that Tim and I can be can be used, and we can figure out ways in which we can be liaisons between our church and the school and to see how that we would best fit in in a very different culture. So we're going to a place that um, where the opportunities haven't been there for bright, energetic people that want to um, serve their community. And so uh, understanding uh, pedagogy and teaching and learning and leadership and all those things that we would uh, be second nature to us probably aren't second nature to them and so if we can help develop that in them then uh, that's what we hope to do Amen. Amen. thank you brothers thank you. give them a hand as they they're done they can just sit down and relax now <laughs> but we're going to pray for them we're going to pray for the needs of our community here as well too so would you join me in a word of prayer Oh, before we pray, actually, let me, I forgot to say this. Uh, right after service, in the community room as well, uh, Kevin and Tim will be there as well, too. So if you want, you can join us uh, back there and receive more information. If you want to pray with them, I think they have some food out there as well, too. Always a good thing. Thank you, Loretta. And so, okay, again, right after service, join them in the back over there uh, for more information, definitely as well. Let's pray together, y'all. 
Heavenly Father, we are so thankful that you have blessed us with today. Lord, every day is a gift from you, and we are thankful for this time that we have right now to gather together to honor you, to worship you. We thank you that you are a God who loves us and whose ways are perfect. We thank you that you are a God who loves and delights in us as your children. And we thank you and we praise you, God, that you hear and answer all of our prayers according to your perfect plan, perfect power, and perfect wisdom. Long ago in the book of Acts, God, we read how the early church was worshiping you like we are here today. And that you called and you set apart two men, Barnabas and Paul, to go out on mission. Lord, today we are, you are calling and setting apart these two men, Tim and Kevin, to go out on this mission to Africa, to Liberia. God, in a similar way, would you anoint them and would you protect them and would you use them to build up this Christian school to be a light in that region? Use them in our church to be a tremendous blessing to the children, to the families there. Lord, ultimately, so that people will come to see you, come to know how great and amazing that you are. Lord, we're excited for the great things that you will do and the great report that we'll receive back from them as well. Lord, as we continue in our prayers, we pray for those who right now are needing your strength, those who are needing your hope, and those who need your mercy. We pray for Jack Dawson, our brother, as he continues in his battle with cancer. Would you strengthen him? Would you bless him and heal him, Lord? We pray for Judy Schulte as she has lost two members of her family recently as well, too. We pray for Ann Collier, who's receiving hospice care. We pray for her husband, Don. We pray for Sandy McOwen, who is struggling with his health. We pray for his wife, Francine, as she faithfully cares for him as well. We also pray for James and Rachel Winslow and their children as they move soon to the Portland area. May you surround them with a loving church community as they continue to follow you. We're thankful for the times that we had here together. Lord, as they follow you, will you also bless them and lead them? We lift up all these dear brothers and sisters. We lift up these families to you, O oh God, and we entrust them into your care. Lord, as we've also just heard, we thank you so much for our youth ministry. We pray for our youth ministry here. Continue to bless our amazing pastors. Bless these leaders, Lord. And Lord, would you grant us more, more leaders, people even here right now. Lord, would you tug upon their hearts and would you just be speaking to us, Lord, so that we would get involved, that we would respond to this call, Lord, to really do our part in making a great difference in this generation. Lord, for these faithful servants who are serving you even right now, would you sustain them and fill them up with your wisdom and your love and compassion so that they can continue to pour out into these students, these students whom you love so much. For these young teenagers now, whose lives, whose minds are bombarded with loud voices as to what is true, as to what is real and what is beautiful. I pray, God, that you will be revealed, that, God, we would see you in fresh and powerful ways. Would you open up blind eyes and break through hard hearts so that we would hear reports that these are the days of renewal, that these are the days of revival and salvation in the lives of these students. And, Father, we pray this for ourselves, too, as our dear brother Benji comes up to speak and teach for us. Lord, would you humble us? Would you give us open ears to hear your voice, open ears and eyes to see you and what you are doing, open minds to know you, open hearts, oh God, to believe in you, to faithfully obey you? Would you use your servant, anoint Benji, so that he might proclaim your praises as you, you have called us out of darkness and into marvelous light. May we as a church, as your people, desire your word, that the things of this world, this world will go strangely dim. And so, Lord, that we would just desire your word and more of you and more of your presence and power in our lives. And that we will be able to taste and see how you are so good as we grow up in your salvation. We praise you and we thank you. We're excited for what we are about to receive now. Give us attentive hearts and ears to listen to you. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Go ahead, bud. Well, thank you, Ken. Hey, good morning, Santa Barbara Community Church. Good to be together again this morning. I guess it's still morning. I don't, I don't really know. And um, I am excited because we are today going to kind of make a turn toward the end of our time in Genesis. I'm not excited because I haven't enjoyed our time in Genesis. I have. I'm really grateful for the time we've spent here. But today and then next week, Mike will wrap us up in our time in Genesis. And then we will spend a few weeks thinking together again about what does it mean to be church together before then in the middle of September, we are going to jump into the prophecy of Isaiah. Really great book. I'm so excited about jumping into that. But before we get to all of that, we have to finish out Joseph's story that we've been following for a while. 
Last week, you may have noticed Ken did an excellent job teaching us, but he left us on a bit of a cliffhanger. We know from the story that Joseph had ascended to power in Egypt and that his brothers had come to Egypt in need of food. There had been a famine that had swept through the entire region, and his brothers came to beg for food, but they didn't actually know that the person in front of whom they were standing was their long-lost brother. They didn't recognize him. Joseph tested them, and he placed a silver cup in a bag of grain, and thereby he was, he was initiating a test to see where the brothers were in, in relation to their younger brother, Benjamin, who had taken Joseph's place as the father's favorite. And so the silver cup was discovered in Benjamin's bag of grain. And that's where Ken left us last week. And so between where we ended last week and where we're going to be in a moment, I want to fill in a gap for us. So the Cup is discovered, the brothers come back, and they are accused of theft. And surprisingly, perhaps, the brothers confess to theft. Though they have no idea how the cup got there, they say, clearly, we did wrong. And Joseph demands that Benjamin, who is now the favorite, be kept as a slave in Egypt. And that looks like that's exactly what's going to happen until Judah steps up. Judah is another one of the brothers, and this is a moment of a remarkable turnaround in Judah's character. You may remember way back in chapter 37 when Joseph was being beaten and assaulted by his brothers. It was actually Judah's idea to sell Joseph into slavery to the passing travelers. And then in chapter 38, Judah is shown as very unrighteous in his dealings with his own daughter-in-law, Tamar. Judah has been a very unsavory character thus far in the story. And yet in chapter 44, when Joseph says, Benjamin needs to be kept with me in slavery in Egypt, it's actually Judah who not only steps up to advocate for his brother, he even offers to take his place. And it sets up this really dramatic moment that might seem familiar if you've ever watched a movie. So one of Hollywood's most trusted approaches involves a reveal. Perhaps the characters in the movie learn something that you as a viewer already know, or maybe even sometimes the viewers are surprised as well. But this great reveal moment. So the dread pirate Roberts gets pushed down a hill and as he tumbles down, he says, as you wish. And Buttercup realizes, oh no, and tosses herself down the hill, which is counterproductive, but she does it. (laughs) Or maybe you're more of a rom-com person. And the moment when Tom Hanks walks around the corner and says, don't cry, shop girl. And Meg Ryan sobs, I wanted it to be you. I'm one of seven people that's seen You've Got Mail, but I'm cool with that. (laughs) Totally okay. Or maybe you're more of a, Ken mentioned he's not a superhero movie person. I am. So maybe you just think of the moment when Tony Stark is standing in front of an entire press conference and he just tells the world, I am Iron Man. And there are, yeah. Maybe that. I want you to know that that idea, no matter how dramatic it may have seemed in a movie that you've seen, won't come close to what we are about to read. Genesis 45, I hope you have a Bible and I hope you will open it to Genesis 45. It contains one of the most dramatic reveals in all of scripture. Joseph's brothers are standing in front of him not knowing who he is. They're there in desperation. And then we read this in Genesis 45, beginning in verse one. Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all his attendants, and he cried out, have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers, and he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. We're going to stop there for now, and I want to talk about this surprising revelation. I think it is really tough for even Hollywood to capture the dramatic weight of what we just read right here. Seeing how his brothers have changed 
hearing Judah's urgent pleading for Benjamin's life, well, Joseph breaks down and he sends all the Egyptian attendants away because in the words of Carrie Underwood, you can't cry pretty. I want you to imagine the tension in the room for a moment as the second most powerful man in Egypt sobs, something that would have been beneath his station, beneath his dignity, but he sobs in front of these Hebrew shepherds and they have no idea why. It had to have been a really tense moment. And then in verse three comes this bombshell, I am Joseph. How many times over the years had the brothers relived in their memory that horrible, traumatic day when they stripped their brother of his robe and they threw him into a cistern and they ignored his pleas for mercy and they sold him to a band of travelers and then they killed an animal and soaked that robe in blood and lied to their father to cover their own wickedness. And now here, in the most unlikely of all places, they discover that the one who once pled for his own life now held their lives in his hand. So no wonder the text tells us in verse three that they were terrified at his presence. Ken last week helped us think about how sometimes the memory of past sins can actually entrap us. It can cripple us for future faithfulness. This seems to be where the brothers were. You might remember this comment from chapter 42, verse 21, when they saw the silver cup in the bag of grain. They said, surely we are being punished because of our brother. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded with us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Well, if you're already operating from that framework, you can imagine the depths of their fear their self-concern when Joseph makes his identity known to them. And I have to say that their fears probably weren't super relieved when he said, come close to me. (laughs) And then he adds, I'm your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And you can imagine them thinking, this isn't helping us feel any better. (laughs) Well, anyone who's ever been a kid knows that there's different ways to hear the words, come here. And we don't know how Joseph spoke it. The text seems to suggest that he probably spoke it in a manner that was pretty inviting, but it's not hard to imagine the brothers, nonetheless, being on pins and needles. They have no idea what he's going to say. So let's pick up the story in verse five. The text tells us, Joseph said to them, and now do not be distressed. And do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now, there has been famine in the land and for the next five years, there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. I wanna stop there and talk for a few minutes about Joseph's surprising perspective because that's a really different take on hard circumstances, wouldn't you say? If you had to identify a key word in in those verses, verses five through eight, what would you think it would be? You can shout it out. This would be interactive portion of the sermon. Or I'll tell you. I w- yes, I thank you, those that heard the service in the nine o'clock service. Um, <laughs> I would vote for the word sent. Did you notice in verse five, he says, God sent me. Verse seven, God sent me. Verse eight, it was not you who sent me, but God. And though we have traveled some really rocky terrain in Joseph's story, his perspective here is perhaps the most staggering part of a staggering story. Let's not sugarcoat this. Before he came to sit on the second highest throne in Egypt, this dude was beaten, left for dead, trafficked into slavery instead, falsely accused, and then thrown into prison where he was forgotten. And yet if Joseph's life was a series of photos posted to Instagram, he tags them with hashtag God's plan. That's surprising. 
But I do want you to notice that Joseph doesn't actually just discount the trauma. He doesn't discount the trauma like a character in that classic of American cinema, Roadhouse. Have you ever seen the movie Roadhouse? If you haven't, you haven't missed anything. But let me tell you, it's probably on TNT now and probably will be again at 2 o'clock and 4 o'clock. But it centers on a character who's actually a bouncer at biker bars and roadside bars, and his name is Dalton, but he's a bouncer with a heart of gold, as you would expect. So the point is, at one point, he travels from town to town, and he carries with him his own medical records, and, and at one juncture in the film, he's meeting with um, the doctor who's looking over all of this, and she says, wow, you've, you've endured a lot of pain in life, and then he utters this classic line, pain don't hurt. That's dumb. I'm just, by definition, pain hurts. That's actually what pain is. Verse four would be really odd if it read, I am your brother Joseph, the one whose life has gone just how I would have drawn it up and who has no hard memories because pain don't hurt. No, that would be destructive denial. Instead, did you notice? Joseph says, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And by mentioning being sold into slavery, Joseph actually refuses to discount the trauma while he continues to confess the ways that God worked despite of the trauma, the ways that God took even the darkest, the messiest, the most shameful events of his life story and used them to weave something powerful and even redemptive. I've been reading a book recently called Becoming Brave by Brenda Salter McNeil, and she relays this story. I thought of it this week as I was prepping this teaching. She says, the Akan people in Ghana are monotheistic and believe that no one is here on earth by accident. There is a reason why the God of the universe has summoned every human being to be born. Therefore, according to traditional custom of the Akan people, when someone wants to know a person better, they ask them the following powerful and prophetic question, what called you forth? What called you forth? And for Joseph, his rise to prominence in Egypt was what called him forth because it was the great design that began to make sense of even the messiest parts of his life story. The theological term for this is a confession in providence, the belief that God is in control. God is able to control the events of our lives for his good purposes. And I wanna say, if some of us may be tempted to let past sins entrap us and define us, yet still others of us, well, we are sometimes tempted to allow the traumas of life to define us. Rather than the things that we've done, we are fixated on the things that have been done to us, the things that we have suffered. And so we conclude, well, I, I'm damaged goods because I've been divorced, I've been abused, I didn't go to that elite college, I grew up in poverty. You can fill in the blank. It is easy to believe because of what has happened to me, I'm somehow stuck, not Joseph. Instead, he seems focused on God's work in spite of the trauma. Did you notice? He said, he made me father to Pharaoh, meaning I, I give counsel to Pharaoh. I provide wisdom to Pharaoh. And I'm Lord of his entire household and ruler of all Egypt. Joseph is in effect saying, despite the trauma, look what God has done in putting me in this place. And this isn't just a passing thought for Joseph either. This isn't a one-time thing. Later on, after his own father dies, his brothers grow really concerned that now that dad's dead, Joseph's gonna finally take vengeance on us. And Joseph actually doubles down on this thought. In one of the most famous verses in all of Genesis, chapter 50, verse 20, he says this to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. That is a stunning confession of belief in providence. And I have to tell you, full disclosure, though I find it theologically beautiful and rich, this is also a little difficult to come to terms with. Does anyone else think that it feels like Joseph and maybe even God are being a little soft on crime here? 
like maybe they're letting their brothers off a little bit too easily with a Pollyanna-like spin on darkness. I've really grappled with this this week, and though I can get down with his statement theologically, practically, this is not an easy pill to swallow. But I was really helped and even challenged by Old Testament scholar John Walton this week. He writes this, God did not approve of the treachery of Joseph's brothers. They were fully responsible for their crime. He did not make them do it. He did not need their treachery to accomplish his plan. But some way or other, Joseph was going to get to Egypt and come to the place where God's blessing and deliverance could come through him. And then he says this, if God cannot use the sinful choices that we make, his sovereignty is limited and there is no hope for any of us. Isn't that good? He's right. Those of us who are a part of the family of God by faith in Jesus, we have staked our lives on the belief that God can and does redeem our sinful choices. And not only that, he uniquely delights to bring beauty out of darkness. And so I wanna say, friends, whether your life looks more like the brother's life or Joseph's life, God regularly works in the darkest, messiest things of life, either the things we've done or the things that have been done to us. And he works in them to bring about something that can only point to his glory and his power. And as we keep reading, we're going to see that the beauty God brings out of Joseph's darkness, well, it's not just for Joseph alone. So let's keep reading, beginning in verse nine. Joseph says this to his brothers. Now hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. You, your children and grandchildren, your flocks and herds and all you have, I will provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to you will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded me in Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father down here quickly. And this is where the part of the story shows us a surprising provision because Joseph sees in the arrival of his brothers not only a chance at relational restoration, but also a chance at preservation. Back in verse seven, he spoke of a great deliverance and preservation for the family. And here he makes clear what that means. They are all invited to come to Egypt so they can benefit from Joseph's advanced famine planning. We didn't look at it, but back in chapter 41, God had revealed through Joseph's ability to interpret dreams that there was a severe famine that would be coming. There would be seven years of famine, but just before those seven years of famine, there were going to be seven years of abundance. And so Joseph, clearly applying his learning from Financial Peace University, he says, hey, why don't we save during the years of abundance so that we are prepared for the years of famine? He developed this plan and now in chapter 45, we see that even the chosen family of Israel is going to get to benefit from his planning. And so what begins here is furthered in the next few chapters, 46 and 47. 46 kind of serves as a recap, a long list of family members that came down to Egypt. But I want us to pick up the story in chapter 47, verse five. You can turn there. I'm also gonna read it for us. Chapter 47, verse five. Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you, and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen, and if you know of any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my own livestock. Now again, this part of the story ought to surprise us a little bit. Verse one had mentioned that it's not just the people who come and are invited down, but also their flocks and their herds. Now, flocks and herds re require land and grass and water, which means that Pharaoh was intentionally inviting a massive resource drain into Egypt. And Pharaoh not only invites them to move in, but did you notice he offers them this lavish homewarming gift? He says, why don't you move into the best part of the land? a region known as Goshen. Now, providentially, 
I lived the first 13 years of my life on Goshen Drive in Stockton, California. And so this week, as I was thinking about this, I took a little trip down memory lane powered by Google Maps Street View. And I was reminded that Goshen Drive in Stockton wouldn't be described by anybody as the best of the land. But that's exactly where Pharaoh invites these people to come. And so in this instance, we see even more of the truth of Joseph's earlier claim of God's providence as God orchestrates the preservation of his people and even goes so far as to use a pagan king to bless his people. Now hear me closely. There's no seed of the prosperity gospel here. Faithfulness to God doesn't always lead to this kind of material provision and blessing in the Christian life. For many of our brothers and sisters around the world today, and especially throughout history, faithfulness to Jesus has actually made things harder in the short term. Some of us have lived that story as well. And yet, there are even some losses we know that will never fully be redeemed in any way that looks recognizable to us. Some of the aches of life will always ache. But in this story, we are reminded that God is always faithful to his promises, even in the darkest places. We began this study way back in Genesis 12 when God called Abram to leave his father, leave his household, leave his country, leave everything that brought security and comfort and to trust God and to trust in God's promise that God would make him into a great nation and that through him all nations on earth would be blessed. And here we see again God's relentless commitment to keep his own promises through the various shocking turns in Joseph's story, the shocking turns in the story of this family, God is steadily bringing his promises to pass. And some of us may need to hear again today that God is a God of redemption who has promised to bring his purposes to pass in the lives of his people and in the world that he created. The messes, the traumas, the sins of our lives do not have the final word in a world that is created and ruled by a God of goodness and faithfulness and blessing. God redeems, restores, and blesses, sometimes in immediate ways, always in eternal ways, and regularly in very surprising ways. So I want us to look at one last surprise in this passage, beginning with verse 14. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and wept. And Benjamin embraced him, weeping. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. This is a really surprising reconciliation. Over the last few months, as we've traced the story of this really dysfunctional family, there's been little as improbable as this scene right here. This picture of reconciliation was not guaranteed at any point along the way. Back in chapter 37, when Joseph was being assaulted, thrown into a instead, who among us thought, this sounds like it's going to end in a giant man hug and lots of kisses? (laughs) Not at all. And I got to say, I also, I really love the casual tone of the end of verse 15. Afterward, his brothers talked with him. I like to picture them like awkwardly standing around. So how, how have you been? Well, what have you been up to? In this really dramatic and climactic scene, Joseph shows just how deeply his heart believes what he already confessed about God's providence. Because reconciliation like this is not possible simply by deciding to convince our hearts to let bygones be bygones. It requires a fundamental commitment to trust that God is, in fact, God, and that he is bringing about his purposes even in the darkness. Now, hear me, this is not to say that every story of trauma and hurt is meant to end in this kind of reconciliation. There are situations in which the most faithful thing to do is to walk away from the abusive person, the abusive group of people, the abusive situation. And yet, Joseph's powerful example reminds us of the potential for even the most broken stories to find a reconciled ending. Now, if you've been tracking with us for very long at all, you probably already know that as powerful as Joseph's story is, and it is a powerful story, 
its true power lies not in pointing to Joseph, but in pointing to the one who is the true and better Joseph. If Joseph's story was full of surprises, how much more Jesus's story. If the brothers were surprised to learn that the powerful man in front of them was their brother, the world was surprised to learn that the lowly itinerant rabbi from backwater Nazareth was the long-awaited Messiah. The prophet Isaiah puts it this way, he had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised and we held him in low esteem. If Joseph revealed a shocking perspective on the traumatic turns of his life, Jesus revealed a stunning commitment to the will of the Father through the darkest trauma of all. As he faced the cross in John chapter 12, he said, now my soul is troubled and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. If the family of Israel received lavish provision through the surprising generosity of a pagan king, the people of God receive lavish welcome through the surprising humility of the eternal king. Philippians 2 says, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And if Joseph's brothers experienced a measure of surprising reconciliation at the hands of the brother that they had wronged, think of the offer of stunning reconciliation with the all-powerful God of the universe against whom we have rebelled. Romans 5 puts it this way, for if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. The story of Joseph, whose name means, may the Lord add to me another son, points us forward to the eternal son of God who by his faithful ministry, his substitutionary death and his triumphant resurrection welcomes many more daughters and sons into the family of God. No wonder the apostle John exclaims, see what great love the father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. So how do we respond to something like what we've seen in Joseph's story? Well, I wanna say if you are here today and you have never taken the step of placing your trust in your faith in Christ, that is the step to receive the reconciliation that Jesus holds out, to recognize that in God's provision of a substitute who would go before you to take the punishment you couldn't bear so that you could be reconciled to an all-powerful, loving God that's the step to take. Anybody who's been on the stage this morning would love to talk with you about that. Our prayer team would love to talk with you. The person who brought you would love to talk with you about that. But that's the step, to receive the reconciliation and to enjoy becoming a child of God. Now, many of us have taken that step and we are children of God. And I wanna ask us, are we walking in the freedom of knowing that God is in control even of the darkest parts of our lives, that he's working to fulfill his promises. The Heidelberg Catechism, day 10, asks this great question and answer. What does it benefit us to know that God has created all things and still upholds them by his providence? And the answer is this, we can be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and with a view to the future, we can have a firm confidence in our faithful God and Father that no creature shall separate us from his love. That's the story we get to live in, a story that says, yes, God, even in my darkness, even when things happen to me that I don't understand, you are good, you are in control, and you are worthy of my trust. And that confidence is not something that is baseless, it is something that was guaranteed on a cross. And so I wanna invite you to take your communion elements 
when we take these elements, we remember the story, not of Joseph who was surprisingly elevated out of prison, but the story of Jesus, who though he was eternally exalted in heaven, chose to humble himself and to take on flesh so that he could serve as our substitute so that we could be made sons and daughters of God. And so week by week, we remind ourselves that the Lord Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took bread. And after he had given thanks, he broke it, saying, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. I invite you to pray with me. God, we thank you that even in the darkest moments of our life, you are still God. You are still worthy of our trust. Lord, we don't claim that the darkness is light. We don't claim that traumatic things are good. We want to recognize them for what they are. And also, God, we want to do so from a posture of believing that you are exactly who you say you are, a God who redeems the darkness, who brings beauty out of ashes. For some of us here this morning, God, we need to be reminded that our traumas do not need to define us. We need to be reminded that your eye is still on us, even as we walk through the darkness. Lord, we pray that your spirit would deal tenderly with each of our spirits so that we might hear from your word and from Joseph's story exactly what we need to hear so that we might be better equipped to live faithfully for you. Lord, I pray for each of us that because of our belief in your providence, our belief in your goodness, our belief in your sovereignty, that we would be patient in adversity, thankful in prosperity, and when it comes to the future, that we would have firm confidence and hope. You've secured that for us by sending us Jesus who took our place so that we could be reconciled to you. Make us increasingly grateful and increasingly faithful. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our substitute and our savior. Amen. Let's continue in our worship. I invite you to stand as we continue worship. Thank you, Benji. Just so good to be reminded that we serve a God who wants to redeem, who wants to restore, who wants to reconcile. It doesn't matter what is between us or how far we've drifted, that God wants to welcome us back. Even if you're from Stockton. No. In all seriousness, God, God wants to meet us. And, and just, we're, as we continue in worship, we're going to be reminded that we are not alone, that God is with us. I will not be overcome. 
God, we pray to you, humble ourselves again. Lord, would you hear our cry? Lord, would you heal our land? That every eye will see, that every heart will know. The one who took our sin, the one who died and rose. So God, we pray to you, humble. God, will you work in us? Will you speak through us? Heal our church, heal our land, God. And church, let's receive the benediction from Romans 12 too. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Amen. Let's do that. Have a great week, church.